Yeah, the motivation of the study is the increasing interest uh, in natural resource extraction in the Arctic that we, uh, we have seen in, in, in the last couple of decades. Uh, and the fact that uh, extractive industries don't last forever. All mines eventually come to an end. Uh, so when thinking about the future of uh, extractive industries uh, in the Arctic, we have to think of what will happen once these extractive industries have ended and communities built around those uh, extractive industries need to uh, transition to something different. And uh, this is not the first time uh, in history that the Arctic has been subject to r resource interest. You have the traces of uh, uh, past mining booms in the Arctic uh, all over the landscapes of, of, uh, of, of the Nordic and North American uh, uh, Arctic. And so it is uh, for us, uh, we saw this as an opportunity to actually look into how have communities built around resource extraction uh, dealt with the legacies of mining once these mining operations uh, have ceased and under which circumstances have they been able to use these legacies from mining uh, when transitioning to a post extraction future. So we observed that uh, uh, the way that uh, deindustrializing communities have dealt with, with legacies of mining are different in different parts of the Arctic. And we wanted to explore why there are these differences and why in some circumstances uh, uh, mines have just been abandoned while in other they have been repurposed uh, and uh, used for, for other things. Well, in, in this uh, project we have been uh, people from several disciplines involved. Uh, from the beginning uh, uh, there were historians and archaeologists, but uh, uh, the, the money that we received uh, uh, from, from the Council of Ministers uh, made it possible for us uh, to expand this research and to uh, uh, tie it to, uh, uh, to new projects that we have developed. We have not, so far not found uh, any cases of a mine that is actually abandoned. These abandoned mines are never really abandoned. Uh, they are uh, uh, in all cases subject to different types of, uh, of reuse and reinterpretation and uh, uh, remaking. So like Kiruna, you have had mining there since uh, about year 1900 and also older mining in the form of, of prospecting. Uh, and, uh, and the same goes for Mount From the 1880s and even earlier you have abandoned mines and you also have ongoing mining operations. And these mining companies that operate there, they, they are um, heavily engaged in, the, uh, in thinking of their, uh, the legacies of their former mining operations as heritage. Uh, another uh, value in, 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 in their history and in their heritage is uh, uh, towards the public. There's a lot of, there's a growing criticism of the mining industry, uh, in particular in, 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 uh, in where you have new mining projects that interfere with other types of land use, but you also have potential uh, tensions in places like Kiruna and Mount where the mining company is moving the towns to new locations, which means that people have to, you know, abandon their homes and move somewhere else. So it's, uh, in this case, uh, uh, people put up with this and uh, uh, are supportive of this because they know that this mining company uh, has provided the means of income and uh, uh, jobs for, for over a hundred years and uh, uh, they can do so also in the future. For the municipalities uh, in, this, in, in northernmost Sweden, uh, they also know that uh, mining is not going to last forever. Uh, they are uh, concerned with the need for uh, diversification, to have other lads, uh, legs to stand on uh, once the uh, mines have closed. And tourism is, of course, one of these legs. Uh, it also has to do with, uh, uh, with the quality of living, uh, because many people who have, for generations now, uh, been uh, working in the mines or working for the mines, they feel a sense of connectedness with the mines. They have a a family history of working in the mines, uh, a sense of pride, uh, of local identity. Uh, so for them it's, it's also like an anchor point for memory, these old mining sites. So it's, it provides uh, the same 
quality of living aspects as cultural heritage would in any place uh, in the world. Also in northern Mold Sweden, uh, much of, of, of the big uh, systems for mining that has been built there is also, has also been designated by the official authorities uh, for heritage making in Sweden, that is Riksantikvarieämbetet, the National Heritage Board, has defined uh, 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 towns like Kiruna and, uh, and, and Malmberget and, and part of the infrastructures connected with mining and also the landscape features as a national interest for cultural heritage preservation. Not everyone uh, in the Kiruna municipality is uh, positive about the remains and imprints of, uh, of mining in, in the landscape uh, and in the built environments. Uh, there's a big Sami uh, population uh, uh, and Sami reindeer herding villages that move their reindeers between the uh, grazing lands in the mountains in the summer and the grazing lands in the forest in the winter. And to bring their reindeers from one place to the other, they need to pass uh, these big tailing ponds, uh, open pit mines uh, and uh, transport infrastructures related to mining. These mining landscapes that some people think of as, as, as a heritage is to them a, a physical uh, uh, barrier and something that scares the reindeers and creates a lot of, of, uh, of, of, of problems. And it's also to them a, um, a legacy of uh, Swedish colonialism in this area. If we then move to Greenland, the situation is completely different. Uh, there you have the National uh, uh, Museum of Greenland, uh, who is responsible for cultural heritage preservation. Uh, in the last two or three years, uh, this body has started to take an interest in industrial heritage, but there is no, uh, uh, at, at, at current, there are no former mining sites or industrial, or industrial sites at all in Greenland that has been officially declared or even thought of as cultural heritage. If we move down to the municipal level, uh, we don't find that either. Uh, so the, the munis municipalities don't discuss these former mining sites as heritage. Uh, they are, um, if considered, they are considered as an environmental problem. The tourism industry in Greenland does not bring their visitors to former mining sites. But in the mining town that we focused our research on uh, this um, uh, project, we, we, it's called Kutliset, uh, from the 1980s and up until today, a growing number of people have started to come back. They are putting the houses uh, into shape, uh, repainting them, repairing them and uh, uh, settling them over the, over the summer months and they meet with others who used to live there. Uh, so, uh, and they think of this town as their cultural heritage, as their identity. Uh, they have gatherings where they play music, they look at photo albums and exchange memories, or just simply uh, live there uh, to experience some of the, uh, re-experience some of the feeling that it was to, to live there. So they connect with this place. And it is also a form of heritage making, but it, this is what we call unofficial heritage making. In Svalbard, uh, the mining industry is now closing down. So both uh, Norwegian companies and um, Russian mining companies and the state authorities behind them are, are in the process of thinking of new ways of uh, using these settlements that they have on Svalbard. And uh, in this case, repurposing them is, is what they are trying to do. And uh, here you have all of these different processes going on. There's re-economization. You have tourism companies moving into what used to be uh, miners' uh, uh, housing, uh, putting up guest houses there, putting up offices, uh, reusing uh, uh, storage facilities for uh, uh, snowmobile hire or for you know, practical purposes of different sorts. Uh, you have a heritage legislation on, on uh, Svalbard uh, deeming everything that is older than 1946 as automatically protected cultural heritage. That includes a lot of the abandoned mines. But you also have uh, uh, this, the uh, Norwegian authorities are also uh, in some cases designating newer uh, remains from mining operations as cultural heritage and protects it. 
And this heritage making feeds in to the growing tourism business on Svalbard. When thinking about how to deal with the legacies of abandoned mines, uh, you, th there is a need to think more broadly than just saying, well, let's, uh, let's bring back the landscape and these sites to their original state, which is required in most mining legislation today. Uh, first and foremost, uh, once you have transformed the landscape for mining, it will never look the same as it did before you started mining. If you want an untouched landscape in the Arctic, don't mine. If you start a mine, then try to think of, of, uh, of, 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 of something more creative than just thinking that you can erase the traces of mining, because that will never happen. In all cases, you always need to take care of the uh, toxic waste that comes from mines. That is an absolute necessity. Uh, the toxic waste will destroy livelihoods for people, but not necessarily buildings that were built to house workers or roads that were built to transport things. Uh, th th these uh, these uh, infrastructure and these buildings can, in, in many cases, provide new value that can be used as building blocks for, for what has to come afterwards.